When local growers put great food on Tennessee tables, that's Living Green. Tonight on Live Green Tennessee, we travel to Calf Killer Brewing Company in Sparta, Tennessee, where the Sergio Brothers are handcrafting select beers. We travel to Shelby Brook Farms to take a look at a farm to fork program, and then it's on to East Tennessee to witness a seed to table program that's educating the public on the benefits of eating organically. All this and more on Live Green Tennessee coming up next. This program is brought to you in part by... Behind every Pick Tennessee Products logo is a Tennessee farmer who brings you fresh, local food grown with the kind of pride that gets handed down through generations. From now through fall, you can find Tennessee fruits and vegetables on farms and at farmer's markets near you. Find your Tennessee farmers at picktnproducts.org. Hi, I'm Kelly Swallows, the race director for WCTE-TV's Live Green Tennessee 5K race. It will begin and end right here in Cookville, Tennessee at Dogwood Park. The race is on Saturday, June 23rd, starting at 7.30 a.m. Whether you're a competitive jogger, walker, or want to bring the whole family and your strollers, come one, come all. We invite you to join us to support the Live Green initiative and supporting local agriculture. We'll see you there. Funding for this program was provided in part by the United States Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Connecting the grower to the buyer, the country to the city, and smart shopping with a healthy lifestyle. It's Live Green Tennessee. Hello, I'm Melinda Kiefer, and I'm proud to bring you stories from across our great state on Live Green Tennessee. Tonight we go to Calf Giller Brewing Company, where the Sergio brothers have followed their passion for handmade beer into forming their own company. The Calf Killer Brewing Company mixes the best of local ingredients to appease the multi-leveled palates of even the most discerning beer lover. WCTE Steve Hobbs tells us how Calf Killer produces small batches of handcrafted beer containing unprocessed and seasonal ingredients that should not merely be tasted but experienced. Hi, I'm Don Sergio. I'm Dave Sergio. And we, uh, we are the owners of Cat Killer Brewing Company of Sparta, Tennessee. And uh, we, uh, I guess the way we got started was like most people get started, as uh, making beer at home. Uh, around about 2001 or two, uh, Dave and I made our first batch of beer. And uh, from there, we never looked back. For many years, we made beers for friends' weddings and just to have on tap and whatever, just to make beer. And uh, at some point, we got uh, we felt like we were pretty good at it, and we wanted to take it to the next level. Is we were going to use our the little space, the the home brewing space, and we were going to turn it into a two barrel brewery. And uh, we got all of our government papers, uh, federal government papers, done and filled out and stuff. We jumped through a bunch of hoops, um, did a bunch of stuff, and then we uh, decided that we'd probably be better off uh, building a bigger system. In 2007, we launched into building what is now the brewery, uh, and we launched into building it out of on nights and weekends. You know, we'd get home from work at whatever three thirty, and then we'd jump on this building and start working on it. And it was we'd work till <laughs> nine thirty or ten o'clock at night. Uh, we got through that, and we built our little building. And uh, a lot of it came from since we were in construction. A lot of it came from jobs and things of that nature that we would save. You know, like a lady has a window she wants to be replaced. We say, "What are you going to do with that window?" And she says just get rid of it. And so during that time we were building the building we were actually collecting equipment um, and so we found our brew kettle first and our brew kettle actually kind of set us uh, on what size we would be. We started making just beers that we were actually we were very proud of um, pretty much from the right from the beginning because we never did really we never did really look at recipes for beers you know you like you have books where like home brewers can like build recipes around you know they can go oh I can build this pale ale or I can do this it's like we never did really ever look at recipes to start building things. We would just kind of start pulling grains in, like we'd order different grains this week and we'd find different things to use and different hops and stuff. And we just started building our own recipes straight from the beginning. And that kind of led us into um, the style of beer that we, we make now still, is that we never do really um, make things based on a certain style. 
Uh, and I think people people really got into enjoying the beers because it was like, wow, man, I never really I never had a beer like this. We do make a lot of seasonals to the tune of, if we have four that go year round, there's probably 24 that come in and out at any given time, and there may be 25 at some point or 26. Even. Well, because like that's the that's the, the fun thing for us about being a small company. Exactly, uh, is we can make any beer we want to make. It's like we can bring it in at any point, but uh, um, and we can just kind of go. All right, well, this one was great. This batch was great. Uh, let's do it again. You know, what I'm saying it's like we actually uh, we made a beer just a couple of, probably it was about a month ago. We made it just because we had had a keg in the cold room, and we pulled it out and we tapped it because we were going to a beer festival, and we liked the beer again so much that we just decided the next day we made another batch of beer. We have a beer called the Trail Ale that we make once a year. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that has it has raisins, raisins. Coconut, apples, honey, brown sugar, almonds. It's got basically it's like everything that you'd find in a really nice trail mix, but it's in beer form because I mean, who wants better to than eat all that uh, trail mix? Just, you can just drink it. If you can just drink it, this is much better. <laughs> um, and so we got you know beers like that. We have a beer called the All Hallows Ale, which is uh, it's kind of a pumpkin brown a pumpkin sugar thing. brown sugar beer that we make for uh, for the fall. And we we have do have beers that have uh, that have local that we use local honey. Um, and we try to find as close to Sparta as we can. Um, there's been, the last couple of years, there's been a little bit of a, of a bee issue with, uh, around here. There's a little bit of some viruses and stuff that the bees... We've still got, we still get honey from, like, right outside. Uh, yeah, we've gotten some stuff but it's all, fulfilling. But it, we get everything from Tennessee. So it's just like pretty much anything, uh, if we do, a, like, a pumpkin-based beer, we get local pumpkins. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like anything that we're going to augment besides the, the hops and the barley and and stuff like that, we're going to try to find it as local as possible. Just because, I mean, it's here, there's people around there selling it, so it's like we might as well keep the business local. And we, our part of our thing is that we like stuff to be unprocessed, and Dave and I just believe that the less processed is the best process, you know what I'm saying? So we, we still use the uh, whole flower hops as opposed to the pellet, which is now the industry standard. You know, the barley and stuff of that, It's uh, we use really high-end barley from a lot, most of the time from Germany, sometimes from uh, Canada. Belgium, Canada, whatever. But it's all it's all high end stuff. There's no corners cut in any of that stuff. Of course, we use the fresh water from the Cap Killer River. Send it into the beer, man. It's got the perfect pH. It's got a uh, lot of great sodium and uh, chloride oh. ions. And most breweries treat beers as if they come from somewhere else. So, like, you could go to a brewery and they put something in the water to make the water more like, say, Munich. Or more like London, London Porter. You have to have a, to make a London Porter, you have to have a London water, which, I don't know, uh, that's another one of our theories, is like, we don't live in London or Munich, so we make beer from Sparta uh, with the killer water, so all of our beer uses the same water. We don't dress it up, we don't play with it, but uh, we're real proud of it, so. Dave and I generally trust what we've done in the past more than what we've read in the past. Although what you read can guide you, and that's, that guides us through uh, through stuff too. We look look back at everything. We make recipes. We base our recipes on our recipes uh, because that's what we do. We want to make a beer that regular people can enjoy, and that beer geeks, no offense, can enjoy as well. So I'd say we're we're beer geeks somewhat, but we're also regular yeah. people. So it's like it's just a because uh, being living in the middle of an area where there's not a huge beer culture. Um, you do have a lot of people who are who are very domestic drinkers, and so you want to be able to make a beer that we can that we can enjoy and think is awesome. That you can actually go out and say, "Hey, man, here, put your, you know, put your beer brewed in St. Louis down and pick this up that's made right here <laughs> because it's made here and it's good. That's right." What if your teenage son or daughter understood the value of preparing food for themselves? What if they knew what goes into the foods they eat and the importance of nutrition? Those sound like some pretty valuable lessons, don't they? Well, the Farm to Fork Fellowship Program at Shelby Farms Park in Memphis is teaching area high school students these skills and many more. In this story by WKNO's Amy Porter, we see how students learn to raise their own crops from planting to harvesting, how to bring those crops to market, and ultimately to area dinner tables. Farm to Fork is about thinking creatively, living responsibly, and learning life skills many of us sometimes take for granted. The 
history of Shelby Farms is actually it was farmland. It, well, it was a forest and then it was farmland. So really it's going back to the roots. You know, how do you develop a, a pride of place if you don't have a sense of place? And places like parks and, and Shelby Farms Park is, is, a, is a leading example in Memphis. Uh, it does just that. I feel like Shelby Farms Park is a place that um, uh, they can help a person understand what what it means to be proud of something. We started this program about a year ago with the seed money from Baptist Memorial Healthcare, which is the, our largest neighbor just to the west, uh, and they wanted to get involved in some programming where they could make a measurable impact on improving health in the community and they saw this farm to table program as a way to do that. You know Memphis is undergoing a, a pretty massive transformation when it comes to community food systems. Uh, I think it's a you know a testament to a to a community that, that's really willing to fix itself. Uh, you know Memphis is at once uh, the most obese city in America and the hunger capital of the nation uh, and a lot of that is due to, to lack of access to healthy food options. So Communities responded to that uh, in a pretty major way. In 2007, uh, Memphis had just two farmers markets, uh, and last year uh, we opened up our 16th farmers market. You know, in in light of this kind of community food explosion, um, I, I was thinking, you know, given my position here at the park, uh, I've been here about two years now. Uh, and when I first came on, I, I saw this happening in the in the community and said, you know, what can we do with you know, this amazing place to, you know, link into that movement? Uh, what does that movement need? Uh, to, to help sustain itself and you know the bottom line is you know we're not going to be able to sustain this movement if we don't have young people that are that are engaged in it. The original idea behind the, the Farm to Fork uh, fellowship was uh, to equip young people with not just the, the technical skills in horticulture and, and growing things but also to equip them with the leadership skills to, to take what they've learned here back into their communities and, uh, and share with their, their family and friends uh, and, and really, really link into this amazing thing that's happening in our city. Pure Power Foundation is a, is a nonprofit that's based out of East High School, uh, and they work in a number of schools across uh, across Memphis. They provide um, after-school tutoring to uh, to students, uh, equipping them with uh, skills they need to to get into higher education, and also to expose them to you know, maybe some, some uh, methods of learning that they may not get in the classroom. We've had between 15 and 25 uh, young folks uh, coming out of East High School uh, to the park on a, on a weekly basis, and uh, they've really, really been fantastic to work with. Well, when we come out to Shelby Farms, actually we learn, we listen, and we garden. We learn how to better educate our community on healthier lifestyles and choices and the different foods. We um, Listen to Mr. Matt tell us how gardening is just like a community. It helps bring people closer together and exercise and things. And we garden, like we get a chance to experience gardening, get different fruits and vegetables and just getting our hands dirty. Dealing with the garden, we've grown various amounts of vegetables and fruit. We've actually learned a couple of things about gardening and how gardening is like a community, how to become a team member. You can't do this by yourself. You can't depend on one person to do this. And, you know, this is a big thing that's going on. So knowing how to socialize and how to be able to talk to different people, different kinds of people, that's the most important thing you've learned. It's not just about growing something. Uh, it's a lot more than that. Uh, for instance, with, with this program, the, the first two weeks uh, of the program, we spent uh, in a bicycle shop, and a number of the kids were able to uh, actually build their own bicycles so it's not just about growing stuff we were actually giving them you know job skills around you know mechanics uh, and then the idea is they use those bicycles to get to the program uh, throughout the summer so yeah we're at once addressing one of the greatest challenges we have which is transportation and mobility um, while you know, folding in some of those inherent lessons on independence and uh, responsibility when you have to get on a bicycle and get from point A to point B on your own power, uh, you, you learn a lot. And then on top of that, you know, when, when the kids grow the food, uh, we 
take the, the produce that they generate and sell it back into the, the school system. So uh, they're actually growing the food that, that their friends will be eating. Uh, so in doing so, we're giving them some entrepreneurial skills as well. We're teaching them how to, uh, how to you know, keep books and how to uh, track sales and how to uh, ensure quality products uh, while also folding in health and nutrition modules. So, I mean, it's all very, very layered. It's not our books. It's not our books and it's not our writing. It's hands-on activities, which is, I love hands-on learning instead of someone telling you just what to read out of a book. <laughs> That's, it's incredible knowing that you can do something like that. You know, the, the programming of the Conservancy is really around uh, three core values, and that's youth development, environmental stewardship, and healthy families. And the Farm to Fork program touches on all of those. You know, the bottom line here is we're, we're one of the largest urban parks in America, uh, growing the food for one of the largest urban school districts in America. Uh, to me, uh, that is a city scale model of sustainability of national significance. I think that we're helping people reimagine how public space can contribute to the overall sustainability of, uh, of cities. Uh, and I can't think that there is any more valuable uh, message that can, that can get across right now. After working in the organic food and music industry for years, Ryan Carden and Jessica Hammond started organicism farms in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. In this story by East Tennessee Public Television's Chris Smith, we see how the farm produces certified naturally grown produce. The duo adheres to a seed to table program that helps educate people about why it's important to eat organically and how eating this way can positively affect people's lives. Going into their fourth year of production, they have already been featured nationally in the Washington Post and Vegetarian Times. Organicism Farms is a small farm owned by me and my girlfriend Jessica. We've been doing it for about four years now. And basically, we're here to do good. I mean, that's why we started doing this is we really feel good about growing good food, helping people out, kind of showing them why it helps pretty much anybody in their everyday life. I think I'm a little different from Jessica in the sense that I'm looking at it more from a like selfish perspective and I really see the benefits that, you know, I would get buying local produce, specifically organic stuff, you know, versus what you could go pick up down at Kroger. You know, for the same reasons of we're helping the local economy, we're helping people that are doing something that they love and feel good about. And you know, overall, it's just a really good feeling to be able to do that. The way it got started, I kind of got interested in growing food due to the fact that, well, I was raised actually where the farm is now. My grandmother purchased this land. We have 28 acres and my family lived here. I was raised here. It was a beautiful place to grow up. And my mom always had a really large garden. We don't have farming in my family, but there was a love of gardening, gardening and canning and, and just always had a really good understanding of where food came from. I kind of lost touch with that for a while growing up, you know, high school, that sort of thing. You don't really think about that or care. However, when I got into college and had no money and suddenly it occurred to me that there was food actually growing in my backyard that I could pick and eat, that was a pretty amazing realization. And ever since then, I started wanting to learn more about cooking more with the food that I had grown Everything we grow, we grow everything organically, no chemicals, and it's really fun to be able to just go outside and grab a tomato that you've grown, that you've seen from a seed start to finish and eat it. We actually moved to Nashville for a while. I worked on a small farm outside of Nashville in Goodlettsville for a while. Actually was in charge of the CSA there, which was crazy because I didn't even know what a CSA was when I started. And I learned a lot. And once I had been there for a while and the season ended, my mom pointed out that we, of course, have all this wonderful land sitting here fallow, and I said, hey, let's start a farm. <laughs> so we actually have several locations where we grow, the first one being what we call our main farm, which is here in Seymour. And again, it's my, my mother's property, and I, you know, come out here, and we, we have the grounds to grow. 
but we actually had the opportunity at one point to purchase a small piece of property in Mechanicsville, which is closer to where we actually live. And it's, it's also kind of a neat thing. It's in a fairly urban area, and we wanted to have something that would be downtown to kind of show people where food comes from. There's, you know, there's always gardens downtown, Knoxville. A lot of people are really excited about doing edible landscaping and that sort of thing now. And we thought it would be really interesting to take the smaller piece of property in an urban area, have food growing there, and kind of give people a way to see that no matter where you live and how small of a space you have, you can grow a lot of food to provide for your family that then you're not going to the grocery store and spending as much money. You're eating better, healthier food, and you can really do that anywhere. So it was, it was just a neat way to kind of show people that, sure, you can have a farm in the country, you know, but you can also do the same thing in the city as well. Well, I think, you know, we started out like a lot of organic farms the first couple of years, but as the years have progressed, we've really focused on kind of showing people the overall circle of, you know, seed to table, basically, and kind of showing them why it's important, what it does for them, and how it can really positively affect their lives. That's something that I've always really enjoyed, not even in the gardening sense, but I've always liked seeing something start to finish, whether it's my grandpa did a lot of woodworking growing up, so it was cool to see an unfinished hunk of wood turn out to be a chair or a table or something. In the same way, it's really cool to see a seed that we put in the ground come up months later and be something that we can eat. And not only eat, but taste better than you know anything else out there. And that's honestly one of the real reasons that I got into it initially was the selfish taste factor. I mean, you just really can't beat it. It's really awesome. Um, once you've tasted a local tomato, uh, there's no comparison. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. People ask me, you know, a lot kind of about what my, what my role is with the farm. And I, th I think that sometimes people think I'm the delivery girl when I go in places, and, which I am, but I'm, I'm everything really. You know, if, if you own a business along with my boyfriend, we, we do it all. And so, you know, I am the delivery girl and everything, but I, but I absolutely identify myself as a farmer. I'm not your traditional image of a farmer that you think of. And we don't necessarily do things traditionally. We kind of like to see where farming can go and see what you can do. And that being, you know, growing the mushrooms, growing in an urban plot, trying to educate people about food. We've also been doing a lot of farm to table dinners where we will host people at a nice dinner using farm fresh produce from our farm and other surrounding farms to kind of show people this is how seasonality works and this is where the food came from that you're enjoying. So we almost see the farm as being an educational tool where through cooking, through the urban plot, through all these different things, we can help show people more about what food can do for you and where it comes from and how important it is. I think it's really important to be a part of you know, the local food movement, really trying to get people to understand where food comes from and how it's grown. Most food is grown conventionally, which means it's covered in chemicals. It's not as good for you as it can be, just for that simple reason. And to have local food is exciting. It tastes better, it's fresher. You're gonna have more nutrients and it tastes better. So <laughs> it's really, it really is important for so many reasons. Also, you're keeping money in your community, which is really important. Knoxville is an awesome place. Seymour is an awesome place. And we all need to support each other. And food is the smartest way you can possibly do that because you're not only supporting somebody, but you're benefiting yourself. We hope you'll join us next time on Live Green Tennessee when we travel east to Narrow Ridge where they focus on living in balance with the environment and we see how Binghamton Development Corporation and Urban Farms is providing access to healthy foods while creating jobs. Also we meet Tiny, a 115 pound rescued Harlequin Great Dane who was the inspiration for the Spolney Small Specialty Dog Treats business. Live Green Tennessee where we bring you more news about the farmers and businesses who are making the move to eating fresh and living green possible for us all. If you'd like more information about Live Green Tennessee, please visit our website at livegreentv.org where you'll find everything from healthy recipes to past episodes and much more. This program is brought to you in part by... 
Behind every Pick Tennessee Products logo is a Tennessee farmer who brings you fresh, local food grown with the kind of pride that gets handed down through generations. From now through fall, you can find Tennessee fruits and vegetables on farms and at farmers markets near you. Find your Tennessee farmers at picktnproducts.org. Hi, I'm Kelly Swallows, the race director for WCTE-TV's Live Green Tennessee 5K race. It will begin and end right here in Cookville, Tennessee at Dogwood Park. The race is on Saturday, June 23rd, starting at 7.30 a.m. Whether you're a competitive jogger, walker, or want to bring the whole family and your strollers, come one, come all. We invite you to join us to support the Live Green initiative and supporting local agriculture. We'll see you there. Funding for this program was provided in part by the United States Department of Agriculture and by the generous support of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Thank you.